Thank you for listening today. This program is a continuation of the AI in the Oral History Project to capture the history of important members and their industry experience. My name is Dave Kinegi. I'm the Executive Director for the Society for Mining, Metallurgy, and Exploration. I'm pleased to interview Nikhil C. Trevetti today, who has served SME and AIME in many different ways. But most importantly, Nikhil served as the SME President in 2010 and the AIME President in 2016. It's an honor to interview Nikhil and provide our listeners with some historical background and re regarding his early years in India, his move to the United States, his education, and his career and working years. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about his commitment to organizations like SME and AIME and some philanthropic organizations that Nikhil's been involved with. So let's begin. Nikhil, tell us a little bit about your early years uh, being raised in India in the 1950s and 60s. Yes, indeed. I'd be happy to. I was born in a freshly independent India. India became independent in 1947. I was born just a couple of years after that. My father was a principal of a boarding school. The title was headmaster. That was the British leftover. And the students who were going to the school that he was heading up, of Agra University. Uh, education for women at that time was rare in India, but she happened to be from a very progressive family, and uh, she was educated uh, master's degree in 1935. I have three siblings, uh, my three sisters, they're all older than me, and, and I am the youngest. Uh, all my sisters actually are professionals. One is a hematologist, one is a professor, the other one is also a professor of mathematics. My father died uh, very young. He was only 42 when he died, and I was three years old. Um, my mother brought us up. A lot of struggle, a lot of social, environmental, and financial issues, but she was a strong woman, and she raised us well. India at that time was just, as I mentioned, freshly uh, independent, and uh, nation building was the thing that everybody talked about. How we get back on our feet, what do we do? So us younger generation, like myself, had no choice in studies. You either became a doctor or you became an engineer, and that's it, because those were the two that were needed. Uh, Hard currency was hard to come by. So basically you did things within India or if you had to go somewhere else, you paid for it on your own. So that was the India then. But there was tremendous amount of enthusiasm and I think I brought some of that with me when I came here. Wonderful. That sounds interesting. How did you get interested in mining and metallurgy then? I come from a state which is not at all mining intensive. There was nothing about mining that, that we knew as I was growing up. But the choice was made that I had to become an engineer because I didn't want to become a doctor. And so in that, uh, I, I contacted a few people and they said that metallurgical engineering was something that was badly needed to build the country. Now remember, I'm still only five years old. So my going into college was going to be 10 years or 15 years uh, away. I was in hurry to grow up because of the family circumstance. So I actually graduated from high school at the age of 14. And I finished college at the age of 17 and a half. So at Bombay University, just to get close to metallurgy, 
I chose geology as my minor and chemistry as my major. So I graduated from Bombay in 1967 uh, with a degree in chemistry and geology. And that was as close to metallurgy as I got. Very nice. How did you uh, pick the University of Bombay, say, over um, the uh, Indian School of Mines or uh, the uh, Institutes of Technology in India? Ah, good question. Most of the uh, young people growing up aspire to join the famous IITs, the Indian Institutes of Technology. And of course, if I wanted to major in metallurgy, I should choose Indian School of Mines. Uh, I could not do that. Two reasons. I was underage because I had graduated so early that by the time the, the, the cutoff age for engineering admission at IITs and ISM was 18. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't 18 yet, but I wasn't willing to wait. Number one. Number two, I was a mediocre student. My grades were not all that good. And, you know, the millions and millions of Indian young men who, were, who I was competing against had a lot better grades than I did. So admission there was kind of difficult for me. And that's what opened the door for me to outside of India. So you were 18 or so when you graduated from college and uh, you uh, decided to come to the United States. What uh, led you to come to the U.S. for further studies? Um, you know, it's, it's like a cliche. You say, well, U.S. is the beacon of hope. But I truly, truly believed that. When I was 13, 14, I would take two subway trains to go to downtown Bombay to, uh, to visit the USIS library, the United States Information Service, USIS, as they called it. The USIS library was full of uh, what I might today say propaganda, but was so much informative and so much impressive. And remember, in the early 60s was the, uh, was the Kennedy assassination. And India, suddenly all the people were sympathetic to the U.S. and and really looking at U.S. as the beacon of hope, truly. And that's why I chose to come to the U.S. The United States Information Service gave me insight into which would be good colleges for me to pursue my interest in metallurgical engineering. What was your initial impression of the United States? Because I know you came here in 1968, if I remember correctly. Yes, you do remember that. 1968 was a shocker for me because I came to the U.S. and went to Chicago. And at that time, Mayor Daley was hosting the Democratic National Convention. And what I saw was shocking. It shook my faith, and I said, did I really come to the right place? This is not what I saw in the U.S. information service propaganda. Uh, <laughs> but this cannot be the U.S. It just cannot be. But in all honesty, uh, my, my faith and my trust in the U.S. came roaring back when I left Chicago and moved westwards to Nevada. Very good. Well, let's talk about that move west to uh, to Nevada. And uh, how did you find out about the Mackey School of Mines? And tell me a little bit more about your first year studies in the U.S. Be happy to. Mackey School of Mines was uh, a name that had come up when I was in Bombay, looking at possible opportunities. I had a dear family friend, actually uh, one of the past students of my dad's. Uh, who was living in San Francisco at that time. So he said, you got to come to the West Coast. So my geography was decided I was going to the West Coast. And then in the back of my mind, I had known that I wanted to go to Mackey School of Mines because from Bombay, I had chosen that as my destination. So I applied for admission. Uh, and fortunately, I got in. Money was tight. 
just didn't have any. Uh, but I had just enough to pay my first semester fees. Very good. Um, what was something that struck you uh, as a foreign student in the U.S. in the late 1960s? U.S. folks were extremely receptive to foreign students. Um, and that was, that was the best thing that, that I saw, first thing. Nevada and Mackey offered me that opportunity that uh, I had seen and expected when I was uh, reading all the documents at the USIS. The, the safety I felt, remember I was still only 18 and a half or 19. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, the professors I encountered at Reno, uh, honestly, there was something about the ambiance in Reno and Mackey that made me fall in love with Mackey and Nevada. And that love actually still endures. I am still uh, a, a, like a magnet. I want to go to Reno to do things. How did you financially support yourself? Uh, summer jobs, jobs in the casinos? Or... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the age thing always came in my way. Oh, yeah, to of course. work at the casino, you had to be 21. What? And I was not. Uh, so, uh, but you know, I was so fortunate. There was a, a professor there, <clears throat> Professor John Butler. And let me just give you a little background on what was happening in, in Nevada at that time. Uh, Uranium King, Charlie Steen, had just built a huge mansion in Reno. His original uh, discovery of massive uranium deposit was near Moab, Utah. Original Texan who moved to Utah and, and discovered uranium, and he built a huge mansion in Moab. But the U.S. Uh, Atomic Energy Commission consolidated everything about uranium. So basically, he just could not monetize his uranium holdings. So in a half, he moved to Reno, <clears throat> built a mansion there because he had enough money. But at that time, what he created was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm amongst the mining and exploration geology community to keep on exploring, exploring for gold and silver. That's obviously in the Nevada culture, but then he kind of gave it the impetus. So John Butler was a professor at Mackey School of Mines, uh, and he would get these hundreds of thousands of samples to be analyzed to determine the gold content and the silver content. And he needed somebody to help him out with that. So I stepped up and I needed the money. And he taught me uh, gold assaying the old fashioned way to make the crucible, to weigh out the sample. First of all, to do the right sampling, weigh out the sample, burn it, and then take the nugget and most of the times you had to deliver the bad news to the miner that he's got nothing. <laughs> but uh, that was a source of income for me. Okay. Also, another way I supported myself was uh, a project that I took on under the guidance of my uh, advisor, Ross Smith. It was a National Science Foundation project, and uh, he put me on the payroll. Uh, because uh, without that, I couldn't have uh, done that. A summer <clears throat> in uh, um, Nevada, I worked in a small town called Battle Mountain, Nevada. It is somewhere in the desert between Winnemucca and Elko. And there I was exposed to barite operation, my first exposure to industrial minerals. And as you know, I spent my life in industrial minerals. And that's where, again, it's, it's Nevada. And I just fell in love with industrial minerals business after that. So that's how I supported myself. Very good. Um, 
You've often mentioned your mentor, Ross Smith. Uh, tell us a little bit more about him. Yeah. Um, I get emotional thinking of Ross. I was 19. I was looking up to a, a person whom I could, uh, whom not only I would learn from about mining and metallurgy, but learn from him about life. I don't think he realized how much he helped me. I would observe him. I would uh, any time go to his office. His wife was also a professor in Reno. Uh, and uh, I got to know his children. Uh, but Ross, who had just graduated from MIT, and after a one-year stint at South Dakota School of Mines, he came to Reno as a professor. And I was probably one of his first graduate students. Uh, he encouraged me to join SME. In fact, he paid my first two years of dues at SME, 1968 and 1969. Those two years of dues came from, I don't know how much they were, honestly, probably not that much, but that's not the point. So I always remembered him for that. He encouraged me to, after I graduated from Reno, to go to uh, Minnesota. And uh, he stayed with me until I finally settled in Minnesota. Because as I'm going to tell you in a little while, life in Minnesota was rough for me. Uh, but Ross was there for me, even after I graduated from uh, Mackey. Uh, the project I worked on at Mackey was very interesting. And Ross was the right man for it. <clears throat> um, it had to do with uh, electrophoresis and asbestos minerals. <laughs> Difficult to handle. Uh, but he uh, had a grant from NSF because at that time, asbestos minerals were under scrutiny for their uh, impact on, on lungs and health. And so that was my research. I felt it was pioneering, but then as I did some more uh, literature search, I found out that it wasn't all that pioneering. Other people had done some work, but I enjoyed doing that work. Uh, so that's, that's, that's Ross. And I'm ever so grateful to Ross for not only showing me about SME, but when I ran out of money, he encouraged me to apply for a scholarship from WAMI, the Women's Auxiliary of the AIME. And I did get the money and that sailed me through. And at that time I decided that I would do something for the WAMIs and the parent organization at that time, AIME. And as you know, later on, I did get the chance to do so. So Very nice. Ultimately, at the end of your time at Mackey, you earned your degree. What was your degree in, and what did you focus your thesis on at Mackey? Yeah, my degree was uh, uh, in metallurgy and mineral economics. My minor there was mineral economics, which was a unique combination, I felt, uh, because my goal was to, to look at uh, the uh, economic impact of mining industry uh, and how we can enhance the economic uh, performance of minerals. So that was a good combination for me. Uh, my thesis was on, uh, as I mentioned, on uh, zeta potential measurements on complex silicate minerals as they were aged in aqueous systems. So to make a long story short, it was about asbestos minerals, uh, they were aged in water, and their surface chemistry was measured, uh, and I did the work. Um, my professors there, I'm so grateful to all of them. Frank Bowdish was a direct descendant of Antoine Godin from MIT, uh, Jack Winston, uh, Pierre Mosse Jones, who is still a professor in Reno. He was a professor then, and so I don't want to tell him how old he is. Uh, but at the same time, amazing people that I encountered. And that, again, reinforced my faith in America, that this was a place where all these things were so readily available to this 
this kid from far away. So after you received your degree in Nevada, you uh, moved on to do some additional work uh, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, can you tell us about your experiences in Minnesota? Yes, uh, Ross was the one who recommended. I mentioned earlier, Ross said, that's where you want to go. Uh, Ross was a surface chemistry person. And, and he, of course, his camaraderie was with surface chemistry type metallurgist. So he picked for me to go to Nevada, uh, to Minnesota, uh, under Professor Iwasaki. Professor Iwasaki, I think he's still in Minnesota. And uh, Iwasaki uh, was, uh, he had a good grant coming in from the taconite industry. At that time, Minnesota was focusing heavily on its taconite, which still does. But there was a huge uh, research effort at the university. So money was good, and uh, that was one consideration. To make a long story short, I drove from uh, Reno to Minneapolis, and the uh, first time I saw uh, condensation coming out of the exhaust of the car, and I had never known because it was cold up in Minnesota. That October got cold and it stayed cold for five years that I was in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> um, they say Minnesota is where men are made. And it did make me. It was struggle, trying time for me. What happened is that there was a massive environmental problem up in Silver Bay, Minnesota. There was a company called Reserve Mining Company, and their tailings had leaked out into Lake Superior. And suddenly, pretty much overnight, the public opinion in Minnesota was against mining. Uh, very soon, the funding just got cut off. So I had no funds. Professor, uh, lots of people decided to leave and move to other locations. Professor Iwasaki uh, decided that he was going to go back to Japan to pursue some work at Nippon Steel. So here I was, a first year PhD student without a, an advisor, without a project, uh, and hardly any money. Uh, and so I had to become creative. So I, uh, I, I went to the chemical engineering department. It was as close as I could get. And I convinced them to take me on. I convinced, first of all, the minerals department to keep my funding. And I convinced the chemical engineering department to get me uh, some sort of an interdisciplinary project. The conditions were that I had to take microbiology as my minor and analytical chemistry as my minor. So I did. So finally, I did the thesis on uh, microbial interaction in leaching of copper and nickel sulfide concentrates from Duluth area of Minnesota. And uh, that was a PhD thesis I worked on. Uh, got some publications out of it, uh, but made some amazing friends over there. The faculty at Minnesota consisted of Professor Eugene Flyder. I think SME has a Flyder scholarship. Uh, Don Yardley, uh, and of course, Charles Fairhurst, Jim Lauer. And these were the, the people that I interacted with. On the chemical engineering side, my advisor was Professor Henry Tsuchiya, one of the most well-known uh, biochemical engineers of his day, uh, and Professor Neil Amundsen. My chemistry was Professor Koltoff, and I'm mentioning these names because I don't want to take credit for it, but I have this link to them. All three of my professors have their have halls at Minnesota named after them. Amundsen Hall for Chemical Engineering, Koltoff Hall for Chemistry, and Heller Hall for Walter Heller in Economics. So 
no credit to me, but I felt linked to history. Uh, my thesis uh, was well received. It was interdisciplinary. Uh, funding was constant struggle. Uh, but I, I survived and got out of uh, Minnesota in four years. What were those four years? What was Minnesota like uh, during those four years back in the early 70s? You know, Minnesota was, it, it, it's, it's just an amazing place. Uh, and I have a lot of, lot. I, many times I tell people that uh, my adopted home state is uh, Minnesota and my adopted hometown is Reno. And yeah. people get confused. But uh, I, have, I have so much love because I got so much from my stay in Minnesota. Minnesota at that time was struggling from standpoint of pro-mining, anti-mining, uh, pro-environment, uh, and mining was bad for environment, uh, wrong con concepts. Also, Minnesota was a big paper maker. And so, and they were also like environmentally bad. Uh, so things like that, was the topic that was going on uh, from standpoint of university one of the best and i still say it was number one in chemical engineering uh, number two being madison wisconsin uh, but then people in madison disagreed with us uh, i love minnesota and i still do so you finished your phd at the university of minnesota and you decided to uh, stay in the United States. Did you give any thought to going back to India after that? I did, I did. And in the mid seventies in India, opportunities were non-existent uh, for engineers. There was a, a glut of doctors and engineers because all of us had put so much effort. You know, you might see that even in a small town in the UK or here in the USA, you will find an Indian doctor practicing somewhere and doing well as service to, to people. Uh, and same thing happened to a lot of engineers. A lot of us looked for opportunities and uh, decided to come here. I was still underage. My age continued to, to haunt me uh in in a good way or a bad way uh and so i was uh, prone for uh, the draft in the us if i stayed here and so that was a a big decision i had to make but i did choose to stay here and uh, a basic decision to basically take us citizenship came later on when i joined pfizer an international company that required international travel Very good. Well, your life did, did transition out of Minnesota, and uh, you essentially started your work life. Um, tell us about what the transition was uh, like for a, some, a student from India that was leaving the university, and uh, you were going to become a research engineer uh, in a company in Pennsylvania. Yes, yes. And I'm still in Pennsylvania. Um, in January of 74, my thesis advisor, Henry Suchia, called me in his uh, office and said, uh, I was at this conference and I met this headhunter, I guess uh, that's the word they used in those days for recruiters. Uh, uh, and he said, this headhunter is looking for a PhD who wants to work in a minerals company. I said, you found the right guy because I wanted to work in minerals. Uh, and yes, I did have, I was going to get a PhD. And uh, so he says, here, this is his card. There was a company called Ability Search. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and the name was Mr. Dowd, Pierre Dowd. So I called him and he said, yeah, I had never prepared a resume because I was struggling whether I do want to work or I don't. So I had no resume, but they called me to come to Allentown, Pennsylvania for an interview. And I came here 
and I met the local people at Pfizer, which was a pharmaceutical company, and but it had a minerals division, and I joined that division as a research engineer at a staggering annual compensation of $18,500 a year. Uh, it was great money. So uh, I came here and uh, as a research engineer, and I just stayed with that company for 30 years. So. Nikhil, you finished your degree at the University of Minnesota with your PhD. Um, when you finish a degree with a PhD, uh, many people have a choice of going to work for a company as you did, but also people have a choice perhaps of being a professor and doing research and teaching students um, at higher, in higher education. Um, what led you to go the company way versus uh, staying in the university system and, and becoming a professor? Um, I actually never gave a thought to being a professor. Uh, remember, the, what drove me to come to the U.S. and take up the engineering profession was nation building in India. And I realized that for that, I had to be in a corporate environment or an engineering establishment uh, and not really looking at teaching the future generation. I also don't have the patience. Uh, I didn't have the patience, I still don't, to deal with kids who, uh, I, I'm not going to say kids, but young men or women who uh, don't quickly pick up things and, and go with it. So that, it, I just had ruled that out. And also Pfizer, which was the first and only opportunity that came my way, was extremely well known in India. It had an Indian operation. In fact, my uh, cousin's uncle, well, my uncle, uh, was a, on, on the board of Pfizer India. So in many ways, Pfizer name was household name for us as we gathered in family gatherings. And the idea I had, which never really got fulfilled, was to leverage that association with Pfizer here to send me back to India and become a, a member in Pfizer India staff. That never happened because the businesses were so different. Uh, but that that's answers your question. Uh, many times people look at me and say, you must be a professor. Uh, I sometimes come across that way. And uh, as you know, I'm also a member of SOM, the Society of Mining Professors, probably the only non-academician who is a professor, uh, who is a SOM member, uh, but that's me. Very nice. You spent your entire career with one company. That doesn't happen very often these days. You often mentioned that experience had a profound and deeply meaningful experience to you. Um, shed as much light as you can on that for us, would you? I, I can talk for hours about my association with Pfizer. You know, when you find a company that is pragmatic, that is, has an established corporate culture that is unparalleled, you stay with them. There is no reason to change. I think one thing that young people who might be watching this video, I want to send a message to is, if you become part of an organization that is growing, there is no need for you to leave. The company I joined, the division, the minerals part of the big corporate entity, had sales of $40 million when I joined. They were selling three industrial minerals products, talc, limestone, dolomite, and lime, which is made from limestone. When I left after 30 years, uh, the sales had grown to $650 million. So from 40 million to 650 million in 30 years shows you that the company was continuing to grow. And this was all grow internal. We didn't acquire any other company. We grew through research. I was fortunate 
to head up the research effort eventually. I started out as engineer, then I became production manager, then I became technology manager, then I became R&D manager, and then all the technical activities uh, I was leading up. Uh, and all that happened over that 28 to 30 year period. Again, growing company, uh, open-minded company, the company that encouraged innovation. These are the companies that you want to stay with. There is no reason to change. And that's what I did. I'll give you a couple of, uh, over the years, we never talked about what we did. I met you so many times, but I never told you what I do. And the reason is the company does tend to have a certain amount of, of uh, restriction on what you talk about your research activity. I can talk about it now. A lot of it has been published since. When I joined the company in 1974, the first major uh, opportunity that came our way was the OSHA uh, guideline on asbestos minerals in talc. Talc was a big business for us. And here comes this guideline that was going to put a tremendous amount of burden on that and maybe even hurt the business. We therefore developed a strategy I was not involved in that, the upper management was, and again, I want to give credit to a enlightened corporate culture that pervaded down to the entire organization. Three C's, compliance. First thing you do is comply. You just don't question. There is a regulation that has come down, comply. Second C, communicate. Communicate to the regulatory authorities, communicate to your customers, communicate within the company what it is that is coming down and what it is that we're doing about it. And the third one, competence. Build your competence to address what is coming down. In contrast, and I don't want to belittle anybody, but when I would come to SME meetings and talk about these regulatory issues, which was a big subject at SME all the time, regulations, regulations, most of the people complained about the regulation. Oh, they should be thrown out. Our thing was comply. Now remember, we were under the uh, umbrella of MSHA because we were a mining company. We had nothing to do with OSHA. Our customers had to deal with OSHA, but we took on that responsibility to comply on behalf of the customers. And that brought us loyalty, but it taught me a lesson, taught me a huge lesson. No need to complain, comply, and then be become competent. And you can argue with competence as your base and say, these are wrong. And, and guess what? 20 years later, OSHA reversed their ruling. They came back and said, that was the wrong ruling. We're going to restrict, uh, leave that restriction out. That's an example of why you stay with the company with that kind of culture. And I learned a, lot, a big lesson from that. The company also had a good uh, handle over their, they, they were a research-based company, they still are. And they wanted every business unit to demonstrate that they can grow with research. And we had to, to remain a part of this big multinational corporation. But having a multinational parent uh, was a tremendous benefit. Compensation levels were much higher than an ordinary mining company. Uh, travel was encouraged because the idea was to learn. And um, uh, there was hardly any restriction on what kind of research activity you took on. But you didn't talk about it. And you didn't uh, even patent things. Patenting was very rare because the idea was to hold things as a trade secret. 
Our limestone business was kind of dormant, but we wanted to grow. And so we created an opportunity through our research. And I was part of that, but my team, outstanding team that I was able to assemble, uh, gave me the tools to do that. And a uh, simple example of how we grew that business from what was about 400,000 tons to something like 700, now 7 million tons uh, over, the, over the years. Two simple examples of products we develop, which would be useful for listeners. One is um, a product from Talc uh, that is called Microblock. And Microblock is a blocking agent most of us go to grocery stores and complain about those little plastic bags that just don't open and you have to literally uh, rub them or, or use uh, some sort of a moisture to open them. So we put in, uh, in the sheet uh, that type of uh, material so that they open up readily. The second one, which of course is now a dead business, but at that time it was a great business, was a a synthetic calcium carbonate material whose shape contributed to the burning of cigarette paper. Uh, it used to be smoking was popular in those days and people would tap their, uh, their uh, burnt cigarette. And we had developed a, a product which when put into paper would hold that ash on the cigarette till, it, till you tap on it. Otherwise, you'd have had ash all over. Uh, but you could always hold that cigarette and then take it to the ashtray and tap on it, and it would go down. So those are the two that, uh, that I can talk about. Uh, we did a lot of work in uh, uh, precipitation technology, and we coined the term crystal engineering because uh, that was our business. Uh, on the marketing side, during that 30 years that I was there, uh, we developed a concept of building our production facilities next to our customers, the so-called satellite plants. So the uh, major issue that industrial minerals face is transportation costs, because the properties, the quarries are located in remote areas, customers are located in uh, other parts of the country. Material doesn't travel much because the cost itself uh, of the delivered cost is uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, more, a uh, lot more in transportation than in the actual material cost. So we built a plant outside the customers, the so-called uh, you know first in, first out kind of inventory thing, but at the same time doing it the right way. It developed tremendous amount of uh, relationships with customers. Uh, that's the story. Well, I guess my biggest takeaway today, Nikhil, is going to be the uh, the chemicals that are held in a cigarette now to uh, before you tap them down. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. I didn't. So there, I didn't know that they yes, had that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that's great. Hey, tell us a little bit about what the work life was like at Pfizer, and maybe a little bit about the corporate culture. I think a lot of people would be interested in understanding that. Yes, Pfizer had an amazing uh, leadership uh, team uh, that was sitting in New York, uh, and uh, as the head of the technical activities in this little division. I had my office on the 13th floor of the Pfizer building on 42nd Street. And I did commute from Eastern Pennsylvania to Manhattan, uh, sometimes every day, but sometimes not so because I was traveling a lot. Uh, it was, uh, <clears throat> uh, even the leaders who were financial parts were technically oriented. They knew what questions to ask. When we would have our 
technical program reviews, it would not be only the technical people, it would be the business people. Everything had to be oriented to making the money, keeping the customer happy. Or uh, one of the things I do remember is uh, we would do surveys of customers to see uh, how we can grow the business. And one time I asked the question, well, you know, we are going to our existing customers. Why don't we go to the ones who don't buy from us? We need to get them to say, why don't they buy from us? And so the whole aspect opened up where you establish relationships with people, regardless of whether they were your customers or not. And so we could learn from them as to why they choose the competitor's product. We also were encouraged to stay in touch with our competition. I have great friendships with people with whom we competed. The lawyers didn't appreciate much of that, but I never talked about pricing. So it was okay, it was just quite all right. We were encouraged to belong to, to organizations. Uh, we established uh, a group called PLA, Pulverized Limestone Association, where we talked with all the other limestone producers. That's where I first time met Ben Severinghouse because he was a limestone producer and uh, a Bob Fries. Uh, we also created uh, openings for our business through memberships in TAPI and Te Technical Association of Pulp and Paper Industry. It was encouraged for me to supply product to my paper customer. I needed to know paper making. I needed to be able to talk to them. I need to be able to understand their problems. This is the opportunity of industrial minerals because industrial minerals basically are minerals that are used by other industries. And so you need to know how those industries work. I'm not saying that that's not so, but a gold or a copper company doesn't deal with the end customer. They deal with uh, internally with, uh, you know, gold uh, refineries and that's the end of that. Uh, they don't deal with the jeweler. Uh, whereas we deal, I had to learn just an example, uh, why certain talcs are not used in cosmetic application. And it's, it's simple technology. Uh, talcs in Montana uh, have extremely high hydrophobicity. That means they are oleophilic. That means they love oil. And so when you have a cosmetic uh, additive put on the talc, talc just sucks it up and doesn't release it when it should. When, when that talc is sprayed on your body, if that fragrance is not released, it's useless. And so we learned a few things as to how you pick the right kind of talc. All this because of the support from corporate on digging through, keep digging, keep digging. As a mining company, Pfizer didn't have a geologist on staff. There was no geologist, which surprised me. Uh, but then I became a geologist. I would go to Death Valley and uh, determine which of the mines would be useful. And I would do the surveys and uh, traveled a lot. Travel was encouraged, and I took up that. And that's when I chose to become a U.S. citizen. Because with Indian passport, traveling was difficult, extremely <laughs> difficult. And so uh, that's, that brings you back to why I, I, how I became Indian, a U.S. citizen.